coming tonight, I was starting to feel a bit anxious because I realized today I've been in about five client meetings. I just arrived from Beijing on Monday night, that's where I live. And yeah, I did a whole six day of Singapore today. Like I must have been in this cross section about three, four times today or this week. And I started to get a bit and frazzled, where am I? I walked out of the MRT station one morning and go, is this Bangkok or Shanghai or like, where, where am I? And actually I started to notice I'm feeling a bit stressed. Maybe not just a bit, a bit. I think I'm feeling quite stressed. Now I've been running my business for about three years. And I think some of you here are entrepreneurs, is that right? And the amount of things that I'm trying to juggle at any time seems quite overwhelming. Plus, what's not on this slide is I've got two young kids, um, and I have to manage a husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very stressful. And actually, as I was coming in today, I was thinking, well, what, what do I actually tell all of you? Because I feel quite stressed, and I felt like I needed to Tell everybody some time, you know, some ways of how you deal with the stress, give you some takeaways. But then I thought maybe what I can do is to share a bit about my story, uh, some of the takeaways I've had over the last I think, decade with burnout and depression and anxiety, some of those issues. Because as I look back in just the last few months, uh, maybe around November, October last year, I was probably in a mild depressive episode then. Now my business has been running for about three years now, and I've gone through that stage, if you're an entrepreneur, you know, by prototyping, making sure the product is okay, kind of checking, trial and error, talking to potential clients, you know, doing some freebies in exchange with this and that. But I got through a lot of that, I felt like, grunt work, to a stage where now, okay, now I know what I'm doing, I know my product, I know why I'm doing this, I seem to now have a way to connect with clients, and yet, why isn't the business coming in? Why am I getting still rejections all the time? Why are clients telling me, we really like what you do, but we don't have budget? And so I remember around October, November not last year, I started to feel quite deflated of the continuous <coughs> rejections. And I started to feel, well, it must be me then, right? Because look at all these entrepreneurs out there, especially on social media, how great they do, the photos of the talks they're doing, the pictures they're doing. And so it must be my problem. Right? And I started to get a bit of a spiral loop of this isn't going to work. I shouldn't have quit my corporate job. I wonder if I apply for a job again if I will get one any, anymore. And I did start to get feel a bit like this picture where I felt like I was very much stuck on the 50 feet of snow. Where it felt really cold, like there was no way out. Where I, what, what can I do next? Like there was no space to move or not. And this actually isn't the first time I've had experience with depression. If I go back about 10 years ago, I, I arrived from Japan to Beijing uh, with my corporate job. I used to be in banking. And I've never quite worked out whether it was more stressful in banking or as an entrepreneur. But, but about 2010, when I arrived in Beijing, I started to get really, really bad migraines. At first I thought maybe it was heat or culture shock or I couldn't communicate with the taxi driver who was spitting at me. I, I couldn't quite work out what it was. And I saw many, many doctors. I saw neurologists. I saw ENT specialists. I even saw a brain specialist to see if there was a tumor in my head. Because the migraines started from once a month to once every three weeks, once every two weeks, once a week, to every day. And there was about two, three consecutive weeks in the office where I remember for some reason, at about 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon, I started to feel really sick. I needed to throw up, I was dizzy, and then I had to call the cab and go back home. And when I went to see the doctor, she said to me, you know, maybe you should see a psychologist. You might be a bit stressed. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me, right? 
I'm not stressed, I can deal with this, you know, I'm invincible, you know, I'm working in a bank, you know, I'm a powerful woman. And, and then it went on and on, and so one day, you know, part of, half of my team I was looking after was based in Shanghai. So I actually had regular trips to Shanghai almost every week, so first flight out and then last flight back in. So I remember it was about maybe 4 a.m. in the morning, and I woke up, trying to get dressed, catch my flight, and I was facing my wardrobe, and I started to not know what to wear. And I started to get really frustrated with myself, with how can I not make a decision of what to wear? After all, they're all just 10 same black suits in front of me. Which black one do I want today? And then I started to cry. I started to get really dizzy. And then my migraine started to hit. And I just sat down on the floor. And my boyfriend, who is now the same guy as my husband, Tim, came to me and said, what's going on? As I was like, oh, no, I, I just couldn't function, I couldn't talk. And the only thing I could do was to find my Blackberry, really comfortable back in those days, and say to my Asia director, who was actually meeting me in Shanghai, say, I can't make it. And then Tim called the hospital, and I had to send the doctor over, because I couldn't move by, it was just uh, And the doctor came over and she had my records, and she said, oh, you know, you, you seem to be on very strong painkillers already. Would you like a morphine shot? <laughs> and kind of in that dizzy moment, something in my head started to click. It's like morphine doesn't sound very good. I was like, okay, well, um, maybe not. Uh, uh, and then I can't remember what happened. And then I started to take a few days off from work. And that's when things started to really spiral emotionally. I woke up one day and said to Tim, I think I actually do need to go see a psychologist. And he asked me, what's going on? I said, well, I kind of just imagined drowning myself in the bathtub. Um, in my irrationality, I think that doesn't sound very good. So I went and then we saw a psychologist and I wasn't quite looking like that yet, so I had a bit of hair. But when I went in, he did a Beck depression inventory with me. And for those, I don't know if you're familiar with it, he's actually been looking at your past behavior for the last two weeks. Any drastic changes from, say, your appetite, your interest in things, whether you're sleeping more or sleeping more. And he did all that test, he did the score, and he said to me, you know, you're severely depressed. And I, I looked at him and I was like, okay, when do I go back to work? <laughs> but I had no realization of what was going on. And he said to me, well, if you're not going to work for at least a month. Like, what a way that I'm like, you know, I, I kind of at that moment thought my A level psychology was better than this clinical psychologist. And I really wanted to say, you know, maybe I can manage to work for my Blackberry, but it was impossible. And that one month turned into six months. That six months turned into nine months. And eventually I did end up like this. For about three, four months, I didn't really leave the apartment. I lost about 15 kilos. Sometimes I slept for three days straight, or just be in bed, and sometimes I just couldn't go to bed. Um, and obviously I cut off all social contact, I deleted everybody from Facebook, because I, it was really hard to bear when people say, oh, you're just a mission, how are you? And I'm like, do you really want to know? Like, how are they going to react? And I said, I'm really depressed. Because it seems like people expect to oh, are you? Yeah, I'm really good, I'm really well. So, there was no, no social contact, couldn't do anything. I was a slob. Um, I think I don't really know how Tim managed to continue just pushing some food into me so that it was very much sustained my life well. Right? And it got to a point where it was quite bad. <coughs> I also started to get a bit of hallucinations. So I just kind of, I think my mind was going a bit, you know, what, what's going on? What is reality or what is my perspective? And there was such an irrational sense of hopelessness that I felt during that period that even though actually I knew it will be better tomorrow, I may get out of this, I will learn something out of it, but all that I knew cognitively, but emotionally it was so hard to grasp that idea. And there were many, many times where I thought there was no point 
in living anymore. And whatever anybody told me, I had a very strong argument. Uh, I was speaking to one of one of you earlier. I studied law, and to my own detriment, I'm very good at arguing. <laughs> so whenever anybody tell me a reason why I should you know, live and stay, you know, tomorrow be better, I had ten other reasons to do. And it, it got into a big loop of well, what's the whole point of this? Right, what's the whole point of my work? What's the whole point of my relationship? What's the whole point of my existence? And so I would like to share a few things that I have learned in retrospect uh, in these last 10 years. Like in 2010 was my major episode, but I've had other mild episodes over the year. And I want to share some of the things I've learned and see maybe hopefully it will help some of you. And the first one is to be emotional. And what do I mean by that is not so much the, the acting out kind of emotional crying, just, you know, not like my four-year-old daughter who's just whining and like, oh, I really want that candy. But what I mean by that is to think about how you're feeling. I don't know if people have seen this chart. It's called a chart of sorrow. And it's connected to, I think, a very famous BC Ben Horowitz, who talks about the struggle for being an entrepreneur. And usually what people see of being an entrepreneur is the pictures, uh, maybe if you're in an accelerator and you do know, all the companies that you're doing, like everything's great, how how exciting it all is, we're trying prototyping families, yeah, we're changing the world and all that. What they don't see is this part. And actually, this is the majority of how most entrepreneurs feel. Because I think for a lot of founders, especially in the founding stage, it is very much tied to our personal identity. I don't think anybody starts being an entrepreneur just for fun. Like there must be some sort of driving force behind it. And whatever we're trying to do, it's very much tied to who we are as well. And then there's always the experimenting, this doesn't work, the bugs are here. Um, we do about maybe 50 pitches and people aren't really listening. Where are the investors? They're having a drink at the other side of the room. You know, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. And there's a lot, a lot of self-doubt. <clears throat> and yet it's very hard for us to be very conscious of it because we tell ourselves we can do it, we push through it, we persist. And so when people ask ourselves, ask us, how are you? Fine, oh, we're okay. And yet, I think at the same time, we're feeling a lot of what else is behind. Anxiety, frustration, disappointment, doubt, insecurity, really crushed. Like me today, I think about at about five o'clock, just before we came in, I was probably ready to collapse. And, and yet, then we keep going. And we feel we can't talk about it because if I tell you I'm feeling really stressed, what are you all gonna think about me? Yeah. What is my credibility here talking to you about stress and burnout if I'm feeling stressed? Like the whole irony of it. I would, I would be afraid of being judged as well, the rejection, or even just that sense of, well, what if nobody understands? Or what if they tell us, oh, we'll be okay, tomorrow we'll be better. There's a, a lot of these that go wrong. And actually, in that trial of sorrow, when experimenting the sound is going on, there's a lot more that's going on underneath the surface in our unconscious mind that sometimes we ourselves are not conscious of. Now, this is a graph done by J.M. Fisher. It's a graph on personal transitions, the emotions that go with us. At most times, we kind of go, well, can we really do this? And then we go, yes, we can. This is the plan, this is the action. We can go look for these resources. And then we forget that actually <coughs> inside, maybe there are other emotions bubbling. The self-doubt, the fear, the guilt of, like, for me, I have two young kids. I'm like, oh, maybe I should go back to a corporate job to pay the school fees. You know, like, those guilt, the resentment, and even being here in Singapore for two weeks, I've not seen my kids. I think there's also all that sort of is going on beneath that I can definitely do it. <coughs> and so I started to realize 
know, when I was working and before my previous depression, the really only emotion I had was okay. And then I started to learn that okay wasn't really an emotion at all. And growing up in Hong Kong, which was extremely competitive, and I think a lot of you may empathize from being in Singapore, so the whole Asian culture, let's do more. I'd go home, my math test was 98 out of 100. My mom's like, what happens to the other two marks? <laughs> right? And also that culture of don't cry in front of people. Right? You've got to be strong in front of people. You've got to be smiling. If anything, you keep it to yourself. And so eventually, what I found was, I started to just say, yeah, I'm really happy. And the only thing I knew was happy and unhappy. I didn't realize there's a whole range of emotions and a whole intensity of emotions. And even, I, I did a workshop once where I asked people to say, well, let's just think of one emotion, happy. Let's think of all the synonyms that we can have of happy. And everybody took out the phone and started to be <laughs> to feel the actual intensity, whether I'm just a little bit upset or whether I'm in fury and in a rage. Right. Because those can also tell us different things about us or how much that incident matters to us. And so I really encourage people to sort of ask themselves, how am I really feeling now? And I hear a lot of people go, well, you know, being the positive emotions and these other negative emotions think positively and all that. The other thing I learned is there isn't positive or negative emotions. They are all just emotions. And granted, yes, some of them are unpleasant to feel. However, I think the fact that we call emotions positive or negative labels it, and then we ourselves get into that assumption, well, I can't feel this because it's negative. And so how do we really sometimes feel how we're feeling? And one thing I learned was to scan my body. Now when I was still working in Tokyo, I'd get maybe a cold every month or so, and I'd say to myself that air conditioning in the office is too cold. Right? And then there are times when I'm a little bit more self-aware, and know that I'm having a stomach ache because I'm running around, and because I forgot to have lunch two days in a row. However, I, I ignored all those signs. But my body was starting to tell me something. My immunity was not that strong. Right? Otherwise, why would I be getting a cold all the time? Why is my stomach always twisted up? And I started to see as I was recovering from depression how disconnected I was with my body. I started calligraphy classes, and one day I was holding my brush like this. And my teacher said to me, relax your wrist. And for the life of me, I could not know, I did not know where my wrist was. I knew it was there, but I was not able to go from the brain to my wrist to say relax. Because actually for maybe, I don't know, the last 15 years, my body has always been so tense at the computer, in the Blackberry ticking, and on heels, you know, my center of gravity was always been holding very heavy bags as well. And I started to disconnect from how my body was feeling and what it was telling me. And so I think it's very important that we scan our body sometimes and go, my, my shoulder's really tight, so I'm getting this neck ache all the time. What is it telling me? What is going on? And one thing that is extremely hard to do, I find, is to be honest with ourselves. You know, just at least with ourselves. How are we really feeling? Because as an entrepreneur, we hear a lot of these dramas, fake it till you make it. Right? And pretend you have it all down. Right? Because investors want to see the confidence. They want to see you just all polished, you have your pitch memorized, you know every answer that you know, every, you know five minutes you've got, and it has to be pristine and perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I'm sure you're laughing because you can empathize with this and maybe some of our LinkedIn profiles are the same. <laughs> because in some ways the world requires us 
to show the self, show a particular way. This is how we're supposed to do it. This is how it gets people to think that we are confident and trust in our management and therefore give us $16 million. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of that. And I don't think that is wrong or right per se. I think the issue comes when we don't know that this is just a front. And we think that this is really who we are. And we start getting warped into that illusion of, um, well, I'm all these things, but actually we're not. And then ourselves, our real self, and the one we think we are, start getting further and further away. And that happened to me when I was in the boat. I thought, I was actually quite proud of myself. I'm a really busy lawyer. I'm one of the top performing bankers in the bank, you know, group talent management pool, all of that. And I'm like, this is who I am. But actually it wasn't. You know, I wasn't an extrovert. I hate networking. I don't like talking to strangers. And yet I do so well in a sales conference. Right? Because I've learned all these behaviors which was acceptable, which brought me my performance targets and my sales targets and my bonus. And slowly I started to believe that this was me. And when there was when the dissonance started getting further and further, I think my body was also telling me something is not going right. <coughs> These are some of the phrases that entrepreneurs in Beijing have told me when I interview them. I can just send one more email before going to bed. And I will be in bed on my pillow and still typing that fourth email. Right? I will secure funding if I just pull this all nighter. You know? If that logo fits, just that margin looks really well, like that's going to make the difference. My friends, my husband, my wife, my kids, they will understand if I can't show up for dinner tonight. Right. Even though I haven't shown up for dinner a million times and nobody knows where I am. I have no appetite, I can't sleep, I sleep too much, I don't have interest to do anything, etc. But that's just temporary. It's okay. And that's lasted for maybe a month or two. So these entrepreneurs have shared with me, you know what, it is very difficult to keep that front. And to kind of say, well, actually, it isn't really my reality. And the issue there again is when they don't know that there is that split, that's where the issue starts going. Once we actually know that this is a front we're putting up, then at least we have the decision, a conscious choice to go, do we keep doing this or not? Just to get out of it. 
You want to think about it? A lot of entrepreneurs want to leave a legacy. They want to leave impact. Right? They, they're not doing it for fun. They want to change the world. A lot of my, how are we going to change the world? What is the impact? What pain points are we solving? What is the gap in the market? And it's also a lot driven by our sense of self-worth. You know, what do we want to make of ourselves? And we tie in with a business. We can imagine the sort of exponential impact on our stress. But this one is extremely important, is to ask for help. And also to receive the help when you've given it. Now, I'm extremely bad at that. Because when somebody actually offers me help, I feel like, well, I should be able to do this more. I really should have the ability to do it because otherwise, how do I merit being an entrepreneur or you know, whatnot? How can I be a mother and all of that? Right? And it really eats into my pride. However, when it comes to our mental health, especially when we are on the brink of burnout and depression, right? we have to have help. We have to have support from people. I would not have been able to get out of my severe depression had I not had medication or psychotherapy. Um, and obviously, Tim was critical in you know, keeping me alive there. Like, this was help. Right? And yet, I also noticed that in the last one or two years, um, some of our really good friends say, hey, how are you? I'm like, I'm fine. Right? And of course, they see through that and say, well, what do you actually mean? I'm like, I don't need anything. I'm OK. I'll be OK. Um, and each time I do that, I hear my little bells in my head. And you know you're doing it again. But it's not easy to ask for help too. Because especially there's a Stanford University study that says 30%, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs are 30% more likely than people who work in a corporate job to become depressed and burn out and anxious. Specifically because of some of the things I've said before, how much is tied to our identity. And a recent Gallup study said 45% of the entrepreneurs they interviewed are super stressed out. Right, you know, go figure. Why, why are we even wanting to run out of this? And I think that main reason is because we believe we can do something different. Right. And last year in November, when I started to go, well, maybe I should look for a corporate job again. Right. Will anybody take me? Maybe I can be a bank teller now. <laughs> Yeah, that sort of self that went, one way of actually really getting myself up again is to go, why am I doing this? Right. Why am I in this business? And actually, I don't think I've mentioned what my business is coming now. Because of my experience in depression, because I've seen how difficult it is for people to articulate, and because I've seen how difficult for people specifically in big corporations who talk about it because of all the shame and embarrassment, I decided that maybe that's the thing that I can change. So right now, I'm very much involved in helping organizations prevent workplace burnout, right, their wellness strategy, and specifically on mental health. Right? Because I think there's a lot of people who do, yes, we need to go to the gym, we need to do our yoga, our meditation, eat right. However, I think mental health is still not talked about enough, and that's what I want to change. And so I need to remember what my mission is. Nancy it says, you're right, it's not much of a mission statement. Nobody's perfect. And, and what we call mission statement, I think some of you have heard your mission, vision, goal, strategy, or all that fluffy organizational speak. Essentially, mission is your why. Why are you doing this? Your vision is your what you're going to do, your longer term plan. Right? And then you your strategy, your action plans, and your goals, and, and all of that. But if we don't have a why, everything's going to fall apart. And also, I think here, where I maybe digress a little is a lot of my work I do also with entrepreneurs and incubators in Beijing and Singapore. And we talk a lot about what is the company culture you want to build. And because I urge them to say, well, think about the wellness of your founders and think about the wellness of the employees. And we talk about culture and about what's culture. Well, we put a ping pong table in and some feedbacks, that's going to help. Right? And if you get free snacks, that's really going to help. What I want them to think a little bit about is actually the things that we neglect. Things that are, we already have. Things which actually work more and have more of an impact to us than we think. 
Now these are pictures of, what would you call these? Sorry? Tattoos. Tattoos, toys, objects, things. Some people kind of go like, what a messy desk. Now these pictures are objects that are taken from people who work in different spaces. Some of them are HR executives, some of them are employees, some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them have co-working spaces, some of them are in their big building. And I did a whole research on why do you keep these things? And the first question I asked them actually was, what do you have on your desk that is not your computer and not your phone and not work related? And most of them are like, nothing. And you push them a little bit and say, oh, actually I have that photo or I have that postcard, I have that toy I got from my travels. And I said, what do you do with them? And one very interesting thing I found, um, there's of course with all the ties with having creativity, you know, being playful all the time, but one very interesting thing I found is actually when they feel a bit stressed out, when they've had that really difficult to deal with boss, when they've had a really difficult meeting, they go back to their desk, and they actually take their toy a little bit, they give it a little pat, move it around a little bit, some of them have class and they water it. It's a little bit of a distraction and a bit of a play, right? It's kind of like one, one executive told me, I don't know if you assume it, but Mac, this bear here on the desk, and she says to me, when, I, when I've had a really bad day, I put that bear on my chair before I go home and say, you deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so we can see that she sort of this helps them to relax, even if it's just for a few minutes, even if it's just for a few seconds. And so I talked to them a lot, and we started to find out how some of these things are very much also tied to their own identity. You know, their, their emotional attachment they have to these things. It could remind them of childhood memories which they like to keep. You know, it may not be the same bear, but perhaps that's the bear they like. You know, and this one I really like because um, this is a, a regional APAC um, HR executive and he says, I've got to always do these late night calls with the US and it's really, really boring. So, because it's not a video conferencing, it's on my phone, so I can play with this. However, what we find was, as he was playing with these objects as well, he started to think, like he's employing the other part of his brain, the right side of the brain, to think of different things and ideas, and it's part of the brainstorm that sometimes we forget. Because also what I found, looking back, is during my work life, a lot of it was my left brain. It was data, statistics, Excel spreadsheets, numbers, Everything has to be rational, has to be proved and approved, you know, and analyzed. And much less of my right brain was employed. You know. And if anything, if you call accounting creative, maybe that's the only creativity I had for a long time. And why did I start getting into so interested in the play and the toys? <coughs> now you may think this bear is just a little stuffed toy bear. His name is Floppy and he saved my life. When I was so depressed in Beijing around winter time, maybe about two months of not going out of the apartment, Tim somehow managed to drag me to a nearby shopping mall. It's quite dilapidated, um, you know, think about. And he went to the bathroom and I was just watering outside and there was a toy shop. I, think. I, I don't have much recollection of what I was doing. Now, as Tim came out of the corridor, he saw something he hadn't seen for months. He saw a smile on my face. Not smiling at him. And I swear, you know, he was sitting kind of at this level, and I swear he was looking up at me and smiling over at me. So Tim said, well, if that's the thing that makes you smile, we're going to get that bear. And he was the one who urged me, why don't you give him a name? I said, oh, I'll call it Floppy. Why, why Floppy? Well, he doesn't do much, just flops around, lies around at home, watches TV, and eats a few mosquitoes. <coughs> and then as I was loitering around at home, not quite sure what to do, I started to research these bears. Now, that was the only thing that distracted me from my spiral of perceived suffering. And I started to realize they have different sizes, they have different colors, um, and I found them on eBay, and sometimes my friends got me another bear and I got a second one. And each time they came, I gave them a name. And I gave 
give him a personality. So that kind of carried on for a while. I thought, you know, kind of early 30s, playing with bears, I probably shouldn't be telling anybody. Um, but, you know, it, you know, it entertained me. And as I started my soul searching period, I went traveling a little bit too, and I brought my bears with me and you know, took photos of them, put them on the, on the blog, but then it was still blogs. And, um, try not to tell anybody I was doing that. I'm like, you know, I don't know what they're going to think of you. And then fast forward a few years as I moved into studying organizational psychology, um, my professor actually said to me, you know, why don't you write a case paper about your bears? And I said, like, there's somebody even more crazy than I am. <laughs> but I did anyways because I didn't quite know what to do for that case paper. And that's when I started to realize what I was doing with these bears. I was playing with them, and I was thinking and reflecting through them. I don't know if you can read the writing of the very bottom, but essentially all these bears, and I'll let you slowly discover how many I have at home at the moment. All of these bears are different parts of me. They are all my different selves. And if you look at Snowy in the middle, and kind of picture the bank and me. And you kind of see where I'm coming from, right? I thought I knew everything, I thought I was invincible, and I kind of thought the rest of the world was a little bit, you know, come on, hurry up. And then there's also other parts of me where, you know, I actually do want to chill out. You know, I'm a bit called chilly, and I was like, oh, does he eat my bread fabric? I'm like, okay, no, not really. He really likes to chill out, but those are, but I can't sometimes. I feel like I have to keep on doing something. So there's also some bears which represent the selves that I would like to be. And if you think about it, you're actually looking into the mirror and tell oneself you're really arrogant. It's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to admit that ourselves. However, if you look at a bear, which looks much less threatening and quite cute, then it, it suddenly becomes a little bit easier to accept, a little bit easier to see myself, and a little bit easier to go, yeah, actually, there was this time when I spoke to these colleagues and it really wasn't very nice. And slowly what I was doing was I was merging all these cells that I didn't really know I had, wasn't conscious that I had, and reintegrating them. And slowly what I'm doing was accepting myself for who I was and to say there are the pretty bits and there are the not so pretty bits. And this is what got me started with my business of, well, mental health is quite interesting, but how? How do I go into a company and say, you need to talk about your mental health? How do I help people realize the things that I hope that they don't know that they don't know? How do we build a self-awareness? And that's when I started working on, well, can we look at mental health in a playful way? And also, if we look at all the research, play is very highly correlated to our mental health, and playful people are much more apt at coping with stress. Right? They find ways about it. Right? And so, I started this work on called therapy, right? Bear. and to look at mental health of companies. And because I'm an overachieving perfectionist who's worried that I can't stress myself out enough, I decided to co-found a second company called Synthesis. And this one is very much about, well, we can also look at mental health, but can we look at it at a broader level, an organizational level? Can we shift company culture? Can we create a space where it's safe to talk about some of these things, to reduce the taboos, the stigma? Right? Because you have the individual level, the group level, and the, and the organizational <coughs> level. And I also, started to re-engage my right brain a lot more through the play. I started writing again, and I loved writing there. As a banker, I don't think I wrote much except credit proposals, which weren't very creative. But I started to write a blog about my depression experience, um, my journey in self-awareness, sharing people. These are some publications, that, the yellow one and the one middle, you can download online for free. Um, this book just got published last year in the UK and the US, and you'll find a few copies there uh, for sale if you're interested. But I also find that what was important with my writing was it was part of my identity that was really hidden and suppressed for a long time. And as that started to come out, and I can reintegrate all that into myself, I'm like, okay, 
I can enjoy it. Yeah. And trust me, writing a book is super stressful, so don't try. <laughs> but it also helps with the playful bits. And if there's one message today that I'd like to bring to everybody, it's this one. It is okay to not be okay. Because trust me, I think most people sometimes aren't okay and they're just putting up a front. So I leave to share with you. If you want to stay in touch, to my web, if people are on WeChat as well. Um, and that's my perceived reality, and that's the actual reality. Okay. Thank you very much.